I'd like to welcome you all here again to our uh, K-12 Online Learning Leaders Summit uh, for Canadian leaders of Canadian K-12 Online Learning Programs. Um, just to give you, I guess, a quick overview of, of the provincial context that each of you are working in so that we have a, a sense as to the rules and regulations for each of the jurisdictions that you're coming from, because while you're probably very familiar with the rules and regulations for your own individual uh, province or territory, uh, what is required in another province may be a little bit uh, different. Uh, so having a good sense of, of where everyone is coming from and what they have to abide by is, is useful. Um, to give you a bit of background, this information actually comes from uh, the State of the Nation K-12 Online Learning Report, uh, which has been published for the past four years by the um, International Association for K-12 Online Learning. Uh, through generous sponsorship, and you can see the sort of the four covers there. I will tell you that uh, this past year, so for the 2011 report, the report was uh, we had Connections Academy as a um, diamond sponsor, and, and Heritage Christian Schools and, and Digital Inc. as silver sponsors, and I thank them for their sponsorship. Uh, looking over the the past four years. Um, essentially what we've done is, is we've um, attempted to survey ministries of education um, as well as key stakeholders in each of the provinces and territories and then uh, rely upon a process of document analysis. Uh, you'll note in the 2008 study it was primarily document analysis which is why we entitled that uh, study a, a snapshot because it wasn't a complete picture. Um, you'll note that uh, since then we've had much more ministry involvement uh, including this past year where it was the first year that each of the ministries has had official participation. Now in many cases the key stakeholders that you see listed throughout happen to be people that uh, were involved with the ministry but this was the first time that each of the ministries had received uh, approval to officially participate. Uh, so the data that I'm presenting here now is as of the publication of the last report which would have been October 2011. Note that the 2012 report has recently been approved. Our sponsors are in place. Uh, we've got all the necessary uh, research approvals for, for ethical purposes. Um, so the, the data has just been started to be collected on that and the report should be released at the virtual school symposium this year in New Orleans in late October. So I guess to give you sort of a sense as to the regulatory regimes that we're working under, um, there are really sort of three kinds of, of, of regulations in place and then obviously there's some jurisdictions that really have no current regulations at all. Um, the first type of regulation is, is a legislative regime. I mean, you'll note that there are two provinces that have legislative regimes. One is the province of British Columbia, the other is the province of Nova Scotia. Now, in the case of British Columbia, it is actually pieces of legislation that go in a very detailed fashion and govern the delivery of uh, distributed learning in that province. In the case of Nova Scotia, it's codified in legislation through the collective bargaining agreement that the government of Nova Scotia has with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. Um, section 49 of the collective agreement speaks to issues of distance education, although it tends to be more um, how the distance education system is set up and implemented as opposed to the actual delivery of distance education. Um, so in the case of Nova Scotia, for example, you're looking at things like a um, requirement for professional development. A, um, a structure of the distance ed um, support committees that have to be in place. The fact that uh, distance education has to be part of a teacher's workload and can't just be an add-on. Whereas in the case of, of British Columbia, the legislative regime speaks to a more detailed fashion. So there are, are systems in place for quality assurance checks. There are um, funding um, regimes that are funding regulations that are put in place in terms of, of having the funding follow the student. Um, so a much more structured uh, system. The second type would be what I, I've basically just called policy regulations. And in most cases, these are um, policies that have been put in place by the Ministry of Education or the e-learning or distributed learning unit within uh, the Ministry of Education that basically says that if you are going to participate in e-learning or in, in distributed learning, that you need to follow these guidelines. Um, 
So, for example, in the case of New Brunswick, they've got a, a booklet. I think it's about a 106-page um, policy manual that sort of outlines everything that, that schools and teachers and school districts and even the ministry is responsible for um, if schools are engaged in, in distributed learning. Uh, similarly, eLearning Ontario has a very structured system like that as well. The third one is the green one, and those are memorandums of understanding with other provinces. And basically, this really just applies to the territories, although you also notice that no Prince Edward Island is in this category as well. These are programs that either don't have their own distance education programs or are um, just starting to develop their own distance education programs. And what ends up happening is... Um, in the meantime, they are using distance programs from other jurisdictions. So in the case of Prince Edward Island, for example, they're primarily using programs in New Brunswick. In the case of, say, the Yukon, it's primarily in British Columbia, although they do have uh, make some use of, of programs in Alberta as well. Um, and similarly, in the case of the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, it tends to be programs in uh, Alberta, although not exclusively. Um, and in many instances, what ends up happening in these uh, situations is the ministries of education or departments of education in each of these jurisdictions will sign a memorandum of understanding either with the ministry of education in the second province or with individual programs. So, for example, the Ministry of Education in the Yukon has a memorandum of understanding specifically with the Northern British Columbia Distance Education School, or at least they had. Um, so the guidelines that they would have in terms of, of how the distance uh, learning or distributed learning arrangement would work out between those two entities would be specific to that uh, memorandum of understanding. Uh, obviously, there's a fourth category there, places that have no real regulations. Uh, in a couple of cases, uh, for example, in the case of Quebec and Saskatchewan, these are jurisdictions that at one point in time did have regulations when it came to distance education, although over the years uh, that responsibility has been essentially devolved to the individual school districts or school boards, and the, the ministries have really just sort of gotten out of the business of distance education. In others, such as in Alberta and Newfoundland, um, Really, there have at t different points in time been attempts to create some sort of regulatory regime or some sort of, of, of distributed learning strategy, um, but at present, neither of those jurisdictions really have any, um, and neither of the four jurisdictions have any uh, regulations that programs must follow, other than that it must sort of fit within the, the, the traditional brick and mortar or face to face uh, environment. Um, you know, so when you look at this, what you're seeing in, in a couple of cases, or in many cases, is that uh, the regulations will vary significantly um, from some that have a very, very structured regime, like British Columbia, to others uh, that don't have any regulations whatsoever. The other thing that we've seen over the past four years of this study is that the regulations tend to change from year to year, um, in some cases significantly. If you look at the province of Saskatchewan, for example, in the first year or two of the report, they had a fairly structured regime, regulatory regime, very much like Manitoba had. Um, you know, it was regulations that were coming out of the Ministry of Education, often in the form of policy manuals. Um, during the time that we've been doing this study, they've gone from that kind of system to a system where there is no um, regulation whatsoever. Uh, the other thing that's interesting when you're looking at uh, this is that um, well, two things in terms of the delivery. One of the things is that um, particularly when you're looking at the elementary level, most of the distance education that happens um, outside of the, the high school and to a lesser extent the middle school level is still print-based. And even a lot of the high school distance education tends to still be print-based when we look at just the raw numbers of it. Um, the other thing that's interesting, and I think this is partly due to the fact that we're trying, in a number of jurisdictions, trying to make our distance programs fit into a brick-and-mortar or face-to-face -face world, is that there tends to be a greater reliance on synchronous instruction than what we see in um, other countries. In terms of, of the level of activity or the nature of the activity, um, again, we're looking at sort of four different models that we're kind of seeing here. Uh, as of 2011, there were f two provinces that had a single province-wide program, and that's all that they had. Excuse me, that's all that they had. Um, 
we had uh, several provinces, uh, four of them to be exact, that had primarily district-based programs, so there wasn't much in the way of a province-wide program uh, in operation. Um, there were three provinces that had a combination of those two things, although one of those have changed since uh, for the 2012 report. Nova Scotia, for example, will go from being purple to into the red category. Um, having a single province-wide program at that stage. And then there are, as we mentioned, in terms of, of the regulation, there are a number of provinces, well, actually three territories and one province that use programs that are located in other provinces, although you'll notice that Prince Edward Island, the Yukon, and Northwest Territories kind of have that striped green, and that's because in all three instances they are doing little bits with their own internal programs. In the case of PEI, they're in the process of phasing out a video conferencing program, which I suspect by the 2011-2000 school year um, may have already been phased out, so the 2012 report um, may have Prince Edward Island being solid green. Um, in the case of the Yukon, they're trying to grow a video conferencing program. Um, and in the case of the Northwest Territories, one of the educational councils, uh, the Beaufort Delta um, Educational Council, is in the process of creating its own web-based program. Although right now that's basically a course or two and a dozen or so students. Um, so it's still in its infancy stages. In terms of, of looking at the numbers, it's actually quite interesting because when you look at the number of students that are actually in the province in terms of the number of K-12 students, and then the percentage of those that are the, the numbers that are actually enrolled in distance education, um, you get a really interesting um, story. Uh, first of all, it, we estimate that there's probably about 4 to 4.5% four of K-12 students um, in Canada that are enrolled in some form of distance education. Um, you'll note that a number of the provinces have an approximate in front of it. So for example, in Newfoundland it's approximately 1,000, Ontario approximately 50,000. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that m in many instances the ministries of education don't keep good records of how many students are engaged in distance education or if they do those records tend to be um, well out of date. For example, in the case of Ontario, um, we look for the numbers for the State of the Nation report sometime in, in usually mid to late September. Um, in the case of Ontario, mid to late September would allow them to, if we were looking say this year, so mid to late September of 2012, um, they wouldn't be able to give us the numbers for the 2011-2012 school year. Um, they may not be able to give us the numbers for the 2010-2011 school year in terms of the number of students that uh, were taking courses through um, e-learning in Ontario. Uh, the other thing, and, and I'll mention this with the number of programs, for most provinces they tend to be fairly accurate. I will note um, in the case of Ontario, um, basically 90 is listed there because that's the number of of school boards plus the number of private programs because in theory each school board um, has the ability to do something with K-12 online and blended learning. Um, whether or not they all are will vary from year to year uh, so in all honesty that number of 90 there is probably less. Um, I, I don't know exactly how much less it's very difficult to, to get information from a lot of the boards. Um, so we're unsure as to actually how many boards participate from year to year. Um, so, but as you'll note, if you look at sort of the, the percentage involvement, um, as of the 2010-2011 school year, British Columbia had 13.5%, which was leading the nation. In fact, the next closest one to them, you'll note, is Manitoba at 5%, um, followed by, by the looks of it, Alberta at 3.5%. Um, as may be expected, uh, you know, much smaller populations, um, you see the, the Atlantic Canadian provinces are all less than 2%. Um, Ontario, which um, surprises, I think, some people, with, comes in at only 2.5%, especially when you consider the nature of the, the, the program that they have in terms of uh, the, the setup with the province-wide learning management system and the, the access to the course content. Um, looking, I guess, at some national trends, um, you know, we've got between four and four and a half percent of the students taking one or more courses, uh, and in most cases, that is one or more. It's not a full program. Um, 
the percentage of students that uh, take a f distance education full time in Canada are very small, uh, particularly compared to our neighbors south of the 49th parallel. Um, as I mentioned, in, in many of the provinces, and we saw those uh, tildes in front of the numbers there, um, the numbers are estimates at best, and, and in some cases they are very good estimates, in other cases they are just our best guesses in all honesty. Um, and the percentage of participants will vary from year to year, and I mention that because there are some jurisdictions like New Brunswick, for example, or um, Manitoba, where the numbers were much higher, say, during the 2010 report compared to the 2011 report, and then this year they may be up again. Um, so it, it isn't something where in some provinces, uh, like BC, where they've continued to grow more and more every single year. Um, a number of the provinces go up and down depending on the year and, and really just uh, what courses may be offered, how many programs may be operating, student interest in general, funding that may be available to these programs, uh, you know, any number of, of variations um, that could happen there, but they, they do yo-yo up and down. As someone who's, who's been actively involved in this um, study for the last four years now, I guess entering into a fifth year, um, there's a couple of things that on the national front that I, I've seen happen. Um, first, there still tends to be this view that um, distributed learning is something that we use when face-to-face -face learning isn't available to us, meaning that we can't get a teacher into that small rural school or there's not enough student interest for a particular subject area. Um, the prevailing belief still seems to be particularly outside of the distributed learning community, although surprisingly uh, still a fair amount within the, the, the K-12 uh, distance ed community, that if we can offer face-to-face classroom-based learning, that that is something we should aim to do first, and that the various distance options should be something that we look at as a, a, um, an alternative to that face-to-face. -face. Um, the second thing, and, and we continue to see it, um, unions are cautious supporters, and I use that term very specifically. They tend to be in favor of allowing students to learn in this environment. Um, they um, have really had to sort of walk a fine line between, um, you know, not rocking the boat too much in terms of, of allowing for these opportunities to happen and, and for innovation to occur, but at the same time still not being quite sure what this means for its membership. Um, you know, we have reports in some provinces of teachers having as many as 200 students in a single section while still maintaining, you know, a full course load in the classroom. Um, you know, and that kind of, of, for lack of a better term, slave labor is something that the union would naturally be concerned about. Um, you know, so trying to get their heads around you know, what does an equivalent workload and an equivalent work day look like for a distance education teacher compared to a face-to-face -face teacher is something that they're still wrestling with. And I think, in all honesty, school districts and, and, and teachers themselves are still wrestling with that question. Um, you know, keeping in mind that the role of the union is to protect its members um, and to ensure that its members have roughly equivalent, not equal, but equivalent, you know, quality of life and working conditions. Um, you know, unions have been, at least within the Canadian context, quite supportive of online learning with the caveats of trying to figure out what's going on here. Um, now, one of the reasons I think that the unions have been able to become or be those cautious supporters is because for the most part, um, K-12 distance education, K-12 online learning hasn't become a political issue or at least an ideological issue like it has in the United States where it has become really a really polarizing issue where you've got people on, on both sides of the spectrum and and it's a really black and white issue for people and I think in Canada we've understood from the very beginning that you know this issue is all about shades of gray and um, you know there are no rights and wrongs in shades of gray there's just you know trying to figure out what works in different contexts the other thing that uh, I've really taken away from this report during the time that I've been involved with it is the fact that um, not only are the nature of programs 
that offer distance education changing. Not only is the way in which we offer distance education changing dramatically over the past five years, but the nature of how distance education has been regulated has changed dramatically over the past five years. And, and that's been a real interesting evolution to see in some jurisdictions. If you're interested in, in this past year's report, uh, you can access it at the following URL. And if you just go to inacle.org and click on the research link, you'll be able to access actually all four reports are available there. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have over the next couple of days at this event. And um, if you have any further questions or you didn't get a chance to chat with me uh, during the event, you can contact me at one of those uh, addresses. Uh, as well, I'd recommend the last one is my blog, which um, where I post basically anything that's related to K-12 distance education that comes across my electronic desk.